Good evening, everybody. Good evening. Good evening. Welcome to our worship tonight. Um, just um, before we go into the service, um, you saw on the notices there, um, uh, the 29th is a church meeting after the morning service. So just to emphasize um, that and make which sure everybody's got a note of, of that and will come along. Um, and Breakaway on Wednesday, Gavin and Fiona are, are leaving, so I, I, a lot of people from here are regulars at Breakaway, so I look forward to seeing you uh, on Wednesday. And um, a couple of instances in the service, we've got some responsive prayers, um, so encourage them as we respond, where it's in bold print is the response that I'd like everybody to uh, join in with. So, as we come to worship, John's Gospel says, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we saw his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. We respond to God's love and grace using Psalm 145, verses 14 to 21. You, our God, are gracious and compassionate, long-suffering and ever-faithful. You are good to all. Your, Your compassion rests upon all you have made. You keep faith and are consistent in all you do. You support all who stumble and lift up those who are on earth. All your creatures lift their eyes to you in hope, and you provide for them according to their need. You open your hand and satisfy every living creature. You are near to all who call to you. You hear their cry and you protect them. Amen. We're going to sing together now in Christ alone. <laughs> Oh 
is taken from Colossians chapter 1, verse 24, and chapter 2 to verse 5. Now I rejoice in what I am suffering for you, and I fill up in my flesh what is still lacking in regard to Christ, Christ's afflictions, for the sake of his body, which is the church. I have become its servant by the commission God gave me to present to you the word of God in its fullness. The mystery that has been kept hidden for ages and generations, but is now disclosed to the Lord's people. To them, God has chosen to make known among the Gentiles the glorious riches of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. He is the one we proclaim, admonishing and teaching everyone with all wisdom, so that we may present everyone fully mature in Christ. To this end, I strenuously contend with all the energy Christ so powerfully works in me. I want you to know how hard I am contending for you and for those at Laodicea and for all who have not met me personally. My goal is that they may be encouraged in heart and united in love so that they may have the full riches of complete understanding in order that they may know the mystery of God, namely Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. I tell you this so that no one may deceive you by found-sounding arguments. For though I am absent from you in the body, I am present with you in the spirit, and delight to see how disciplined you are, and how firm your faith in Christ is. This is the word of the Lord. Colin will, Colin will now lead us in prayers of intercession. Let's come before the Lord in prayer. God of peace, we pray for our broken and war-torn world. We pray for peace and that you would overrule the decisions made by world leaders so that they may make decisions which bring about peace and reconciliation. So that where there is hatred, there may be justice and peace. We pray for the United Nations and all world leaders seeking to negotiate and influence in those areas of conflict, especially we bring before you Israel and Gaza Strip and the whole of Palestine. Lord, what seems impossible in an escalating situation, we just bring before you that in your love and mercy you may restrain the actions on both sides, so that the innocent may be protected. We pray that too for Russia and Ukraine, and lesser conflict, conflicts going on in Myanmar, in East Africa. Lord, comfort the bereaved. Enable help to reach the injured, and that there might be shelter for the homeless and assistance and help to refugees. We pray that too for those areas of the world struck by natural disasters. Especially we pray for Afghanistan with the major earthquakes in this last week. And when we think of those still recovering from the disastrous floods in North Africa, in Libya and Tunisia. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of justice and mercy, 
we bring before you our nation. We pray for all in authority, for our king and queen, who swore to be servants of their realm at the coronation, that they may serve in ways that honour you. And for all in government, we pray their decisions may be taken with integrity and that their actions might be truly for the benefit of the society they serve. Pray for all who provide service to this nation, especially doctors, nurses, for those in the care system. Lord, you know the difficulties they face. We thank you for them and pray that you would sustain them in their service of others. Lord, hear our prayer. And God of love, we pray for the church that your love may be so evident within its service and its care for others that people will see that this church is part of your body, the body of Christ on earth, and that it might be attractive and that they might be drawn to him. Pray especially for your church here in Waverton. We bring before you counsel and Congress, John and Mandy, that all that will be done will be according to your will. Please help and guide us so that we might be the church that you want us to be. And we commit to you that meeting on after the service on the 29th, that as essential works come before us, that you will guide the decisions and the use of the money that might be used wisely and might be to your glory. In your mercy, hear our prayer. God of compassion, we pray for those who are sick, or recovering from sickness, thanking you for your work of healing in their lives. Especially give thanks for the progress that Bella has made as we've been thinking of her and all the family. Continue, we pray, to speed her recovery, that she might fully recover from that awful injury. Pray for Joel, for Joyce, as she adjusts to life in the home and life without one of her legs. It must be so difficult for her. Lord, we just bear her up before you. For Margaret Hosker, again adjusting to a big change in circumstance. We pray that you would comfort them and bless them and continue to heal them in each of their situations. God of comfort, we pray for all who are going through grieving, who are grieving at this time, or recovering from recent tragedy. Especially, we remember those affected by the that road traffic accident in the Wirral the week before last. And in a moment of silence, let us just lift before you anyone that's on our own hearts. So let us conclude as we say together the Lord's Prayer. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen.
as we reflect on those words in our reading, as Paul declared, Christ is in you, the hope of glory. We're going to sing, rejoice, rejoice, Christ is in you. started by Epaphras, who had been converted under Paul's ministry at Ephesus. And it seems to be Epaphras that kept in touch with Paul and kept him informed as to how the church was doing. Paul had never met them. He only had heard of them through Epaphras, who he calls a fellow servant. So now in this third passage, 
Paul wants them to know about himself and his earnest labours on their behalf. In the NIV, the passage is headed, Paul's labours for the church. But it is about so much more. And he was writing from prison in Rome. And so he starts by telling them of what he is suffering on their behalf. And then he goes on to speak of the commission that God has given him, and then the goal for their Christian walk. And we're going to explore those uh, three things um, in Paul's letter as we move on. And one of his main purposes was to confront dangerous false teaching. This false teaching combined ideas from other religions and philosophy into the Christian faith. Some of these Paul tackles later, and that will be moved on to in future sessions. Um, this teaching falsely claimed that there were deep spiritual mysteries that only the teachers, those in the know, could have access to. And it empowered them to impose strict discipline regarding what they could eat and what they could do. And he very wisely overturns this teaching by showing, in, as we shall see in this passage, that there isn't a mystery that only these privileged are in. It's no longer a mystery. Christ has come and the mystery hidden for ages is now theirs to own and to know all about. It's an open secret. Christ in them, the hope of glory. And his leadership is characterised by his reference to being a servant. A servant of Christ. A servant of the gospel. A servant of the church. His wise leadership can be seen in that, as Jeff showed us in the first study, he doesn't tackle the concerns that are on his heart straight off. He starts off with praise. And, and, and he gives thanksgiving to God for their faith. And then, as Danny took us through in the second study, he sets out the foundation of their faith. And it's the only way that we can really look at problems is to remind ourselves of the basis of our faith. For he sets out the supremacy of of the person and work of Christ, the one who is the image of the invisible God, the one who is before all things, and in whom all things are held together. Once alienated from God, Paul reminds them that they have been personally reconciled to God. And so to suffering. In verse 24, he says, Now I rejoice in what I'm suffering for you. I fill up in my flesh what is still lacking in regards to Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, which is the church. And I don't know about you, but on first reading of that, I couldn't quite make out what Paul's going on about. Um, he says two things. He rejoices, and that humanly speaking, seems a strange thing to say if you're struggling and suffering in prison. And then he says something even stranger. It's filling up what is lacking in regard to Christ's afflictions. Well, why is he able to rejoice when most would feel hard done by and probably be feeling quite depressed? And it was because he saw it was all in God's plan. That somehow what he was going through was for the sake of the church. It was to do with inspiring others to get on with their Christian work and get the job done, even though the going was getting tough for them. And that will become even clearer as we look at this second statement, which is quite puzzling. What on earth can be lacking in the afflictions of Christ? Well, clearly we can state categorically it's not, it wasn't insufficient in gaining our salvation. We can safely assert that his death on the cross was full and was sufficient 
as an offering for sin and to gain our forgiveness? The answer can be gleaned as we consider other writings on suffering by Paul. We go to the next slide. He writes to the Philippians in chapter 3, verse 10, I want you to know Christ and the fellowship of sharing in his suffering. And then in Romans 8, he says, we are co-heirs with Christ if we share in his suffering. And Christ said to his disciples that they had to take up their cross. There would be a cross to bear. They would face persecution. He even said his followers would be killed. And it's this sense that we, the church, and the church worldwide as the body of Christ, continue and must expect to continue to experience suffering because as the body of Christ, that suffering wasn't finished as when he died on the cross. The sacrifice for sin was complete, but the suffering goes on in his body, and we are his body today. And I'll just read to you from Revelation chapter 6. John's vision, he sees the angel opening the fifth seal. And he said, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain because of the word of God and the testimony they had maintained. They called out in a loud voice, How long, sovereign Lord, holy and true, until you judge the inhabitants of earth and avenge our blood? And then each of them was given a white robe, and they were told to wait a little longer until the full number of their fellow servants, their brothers and sisters, were killed just as they had been. We tend, don't we, to think that persecution is something that's going on elsewhere. And at the current time, to a large extent, that's true. And we pray, and Peter has his prayer meeting, to pray for the persecuted church. And we see people are being killed horribly because of their Christian witness. But recently we've seen increasing, increasingly Christians marginalised in this country for taking a biblical stand. And I think tomorrow's Christians are going to have a much tougher time of it than we have had. We've been very privileged. And we can only say thank you to God that we've been spared that. But that isn't the norm. And we need to pray for those who come after us, our young people and the world they're going into. And even martyrdom, from what we read in Scripture, may have to be accepted as a consequence of openly standing up for Jesus. If we go to the next slide. But for Paul, you see, the more difficulties he faced, the more the grace of God could be seen sustaining him. I have become... No, sorry, there's a... There should be another earlier. Oh, it's a bit of the bottom, yeah, sorry. He says in Corinthians, for we who are alive are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake, so that his life may be revealed in our mortal body. So then, death is at work in us, but life is at work in you. His preceding words to that in that passage are, we are hard pressed on every side, but not crushed, perplexed, but not in despair, persecuted, but not abandoned, struck down, but not destroyed. We always carry around in our body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be revealed in our body. That's why Paul could rejoice in his sufferings. And that's because he could encourage those for whom the going was getting tough. Those who would be persecuted for their faith. Because he ministered to them from a position of experience and fellows and fellow suffering. 
Being a Christian does not allow us to escape from suffering. But like Paul, it does give us access to God's grace in order to endure it. And that is something we too should rejoice in. Now we go to the next. We move now to the second point in this part of the letter when he goes on to talk about his commission. He says, I have become its, meaning the church, the church's servant, by the commission God gave me to present to you the word of God in its fullness. Or it could be translated to fully present to you the word of God. The mystery that has been kept hidden for ages and generations, but is now disclosed to the Lord's people. That he's commissioned to present the word of God fully, and it involves being a servant. Paul tells them that God has commissioned him. What a contrast to the false teachers at Colossae, who claimed to be the only ones who knew the truth. They lorded it over the church, provide with normal, in, numerous constraints and requirements in their dietary habits, in their personal lives. But Paul comes not as one who lords it over them, but as a servant, the servant of the gospel and the servant of the church. For Christ the Son of God became a servant, and any who lead in his name must be servants too. It's a mark of good leadership and was a noticeable feature of last year's coronation when the king swore to be a servant of his subjects. And we're all called to servanthood. In that sense, we are God's agents, his intermediaries, carriers of the good news, whether pastors, paid workers, volunteers, servants of the church. We're servants not in the sense that the church is somehow our Lord and Master. We're servants in the sense that under the commission given by God, we serve it. Paul refers to the gospel he preaches as a mystery, or in other words, a secret counsel of God. And he says it has been hidden until Christ appeared. But now re it has now been revealed to God's people, and not just a privileged few with their special knowledge. Next slide. To them, sorry, sorry, you've already, sorry Jeff, you've already gone there. To them, God has chosen to make known among the Gentiles the glorious riches of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. That mystery is now fully revealed. And it's revealed to all God's people, Gentiles as well as Jews. A glorious message that Messiah would indwell all who would accept him. And what is revealed, he says, is glorious. And those that receive it are rich. We need to sort of recapture that sense of wonder of the truth of the gospel. You know, glorious riches. Isn't it so easy for us as we come to worship God week by week? And we know the gospel. And almost it becomes the familiar that we take for granted. But what shattering news it must have been for those early Christians. People like Epaphras and Philemon, there in Colossae, where suddenly they found that amongst God's people, they were a majority compared to the few Jews that were there. And that this word and promise of God in Scripture to his people was now open to anybody who would receive it. How shattering is that? Not just the chosen people, the Jews, but to them as well, the Gentiles. 
And in God's upside down economy, the poor become indeed very rich when they discover Christ. Do we really appreciate how rich we are in the spiritual sense? And what is this glorious wealth that we possess? It is that it's Christ in you. The Son of God, who is the one who is at one with the Father, by whom and for whom all things were created, as we studied the last time with Danny. He indwells us. And his indwelling gives us hope of eternal glory. As we just be as we've been singing, that indwelling should empower us to be like a mighty army. Nothing is impossible. And more than what it enables us to do now, it helps us to look forward to that hope of eternal glory. The word glory is a, a word that speaks of overwhelming splendour. It's associated with the brilliant light of God's presence in heaven. And Christ in us is God's deposit, his first instalment in the hope of the full experience of God's glory when death takes us into his eternal presence. When you feel discouraged, remember Christ is in you, the hope of glory. When life gets tough, remember Christ is in you, the hope of glory. When the challenges of standing up for Christ in a hostile world makes it look like an impossibility. Remember, Christ in you, the hope of glory. When things seem hopeless, remember Christ in you, the hope of glory. We move to the next. But it's not just a down payment now for something much greater then. In fact, there's an ongoing process going on. For Paul says to the Corinthians, as we read there, and we with unveiled faces all reflect the Lord's glory. And we are being transformed into his likeness with ever increasing glory, which comes from the Lord who is spirit. It's a process that's going on. And together, we're challenged to reflect something of that wonderful glory of the presence of God as we make known the indwelling Christ in our lives. He wants to gradually transform us into his likeness, as Paul says, with ever-increasing glory. Later in chapter 3 of this letter, as we'll be looking at later, when Christ who is your life appears, then you will appear with him in glory. What a comfort in the face of life's struggles. What a comfort in the face of persecution. This is a further reason why Paul could rejoice in his suffering. Consider his words in his second letter to the Corinthians. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. The old American spiritual proclaims that this train is bound for glory, this train. We have ahead of us, when we pass this life, a hope of being immersed in the presence and glory of God. And it's a hope that springs from Christ in dwelling in us, the hope of glory. Paul's third point that he wants to bring over in this part of the letter is his goal or his aim. We read, He is the one we proclaim admonishing and teaching everyone with wisdom so that we may present everyone fully mature in Christ. I think other translations say perfect in Christ. 
My goal is that they may be encouraged in heart, united in love, so that they may have the full riches of complete understanding, in order that they may know the mystery of God, namely Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. His goal is for them to be fully mature. And I suppose we could say, not, not necessarily perfect, but grown up. Maturity we associate with, 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 with age and growing up. And these young Christians have been hoodwinked into thinking that they had to follow these false teachers and rely on these autocratic leaders telling them how they should live their lives. But Paul wants them to be mature, able to be guided by themselves by God's Spirit, to discover for themselves what his will is for their lives. And that should be the goal for us too. But he said his goal was for them to be encouraged in heart and united in love. True maturity is evidenced by hearts encouraged despite what life may throw at them. Whatever the circumstances, as we think of that phrase, Christ in us, the hope of glory, so we are encouraged, we rejoice in the face of any circumstance. There is the sign of maturity in Christ. And not only encouraged in heart, he wants them to, to um, be united in love. True maturity comes when, despite people's differences, different tastes, different styles, they still are united in love. John, in his epistle, says, by that, by this, shall they know you are my disciples, in that you love one another. And all this is so that they, and we, may have all the riches of complete understanding from knowing Christ. At its core, the most important knowledge we need in life is to know Christ. And it's not an intellectual knowledge. It's a relationship that occurred when Christ was invited into our lives. That relationship is not only the source of encouragement in the face of difficulties, the source of uniting love. But as he says in these verses, it's the source of all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Wisdom and knowledge, which no amount of human intellectual activity or study could ever discover. We don't need A-levels or a degree in theology to access this wisdom and knowledge. We just need to spend time in the presence of Christ. The one who is in us, indwelling us, looking to him, the author, the finisher of our faith, seeking his guidance in every situation. And he will show us the way. He will give us the wisdom for that particular situation. He will give us the knowledge we need to tackle whatever task he gives us. And so we come full circle to our next slide, please. Back to Paul's labour for the church, which I said was, was the heading of this passage. The achievement of those goals are not going to be achieved by wishful thinking, but by strenuous effort in prayer. Sheer hard work corresponding with Epaphras, trying to get the details of what was going on so that he could write a carefully worded letter and communicate them in a meaningful and fruitful way. And so he says, to this end I strenuously contend with all the energy Christ so powerfully works in me. I want you to know how hard I am contending for you and for those at Laodicea and for all who have not met me personally. What a challenge to us. That word contend and contending can be translated as struggling. To this end I struggle with all the energy Christ gives me. 
I want you to know how hard I'm struggling for you. And the Greek word that is used is agon. We get the word agony from it. So when we think of Paul's struggle, think of agony. Think of Christ praying in the Garden of Gethsemane and the agony. That's the sense of the depth of feeling behind the effort Paul was putting into his prayers and his writing. When have we agonised in prayer in that way? Our usual approach to prayer is a casual listing of names before God. But for Paul and for Epaphras, it was a long-term agonising struggle in focused intercession on their behalf. And the source of energy that enabled him to go on struggling in his labour for the church was the power of Christ working in him. Christ in you, not just the hope of glory, but the source of resurrection power to enable you to contend, struggle for all that he sets before you. Go to the next. And he says, I tell you this so that no one might deceive you by fine-sounding arguments. For though I'm absent from you in body, I am present with you in spirit and delight to see how disciplined you are and how firm your faith in Christ is. Paul completes this section of his letter by giving them reason, a reason for his writing so that no false teachers would deceive them. To assure them that though he's never met them or been to Colossae, the Spirit of God that indwells them and him as it does us brings his presence to them across the miles of separation. So too for us. The power of the Spirit brings our presence into contact with all those for whom we, we are separated and for whom we pray. And he ends with a further encouragement by saying that that presence in Spirit has brought him delight in seeing how well they were doing in Christ. Paul's labour had not been in vain. Our labour in prayer and whatever other ministry God has called us to will not be in vain. Okay. As Paul wrote in his first letter to the Corinthians, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labour is not in vain. Let's pray. We praise you, Heavenly Father, for the glorious riches of the truth that Christ is in us, the hope of glory. Help us reflect, help us to reflect something of that glory in our Christian walk. Help us to become mature, reflecting more and more the glory of Christ in all we do. And help us to be encouraged in heart, so that whatever we face, we may rejoice. Help us to be united in love, whatever differences we have. And help us to experience more and more in our walk with you, those hidden treasures of wisdom, and love to be found in him. We ask it for the sake of Christ. Amen. Amen. And to close, we're going to sing the song, Come People of the Risen King. Risen King.